Hey, Green Machine friends and fans of fun. It's kind of a light week on comics, but it's been a really, really good week. Uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. The Hugo Awards were last night. And uh, uh, Shannon McGuire, uh, the uh, current uh, writer for Spider-Gwen, won a Hugo. You know, she, she's got a record. She, in 2013, she won, was the most nominations, I think, with, with five. And then she's won five. She's, like, won quite a bit. But I, I don't even think that was the big news. The big news uh, last night was that there was a, uh, a fan fiction uh, community. It, 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 uh, they won. It's called um, uh, Our Own. Oh, it's going to drive me nuts because I just looked it up not too long ago. Let me see if it's on the... Oh, Archive of Our Own. So Archive of Our Own won, and immediately when they won, they announced that everyone who's contributed to the website is now a Hugo Award winner. The Hugos are a big deal to me because it's essentially the science fiction of... Uh, or it's, it's the Oscars of science fiction and fantasy, and, and I write apocalyptic fiction. So I really love the Hugos, um, and a lot of my friends... Uh, I wouldn't say a lot. A couple of my friends have won. A lot of them contribute to the Hugos every year, so... It's really, really sort of important. And plus, you'll find that a lot of the Hugo Award winners tend to come from comics, and they go back and forth because they take a lot of good writers and a lot of good artists. And so, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to pay attention to, I think. So, yeah. Um, so a lot of news. Um, apparently, Sony and uh, Marvel had gotten into it, and they sort of ripped back the, uh, the Spider-Man license and said that uh, Kevin Feige wasn't going to be on the project. And then it's come out, like, right, I guess, right as I was uh, in the back room earlier, uh, like 20 minutes ago, it got announced that they went back to the, the table. And apparently the whole dispute is over, uh, like, an executive producer credit. That's, that's, that's what caused the dispute. So that's weird. But they're back at the table. They, they, it sounded like everything was done and they weren't going to, it was just going to be no more Spider-Man in the MCU. And uh, now it seems like they've sat back down. Oh, and uh, Derek, Derek McCaw hit me up on Facebook. Derek McCaw, Fanboy Planet, hit me up on Facebook. He's like, it's not finished, trust me. So, <laughs> and he was right. Yeah, uh, Derek, <laughs> Derek usually is right, so. I tend to trust him because whenever I'm believing like a weird movie rumor, if I put it on Facebook, Derek's like, stop it. Like, <laughs> it's not, this isn't true. Knock this off. Yeah, so. Yeah, when I, when I was a kid, Derek was one of my mentors when I was uh, when I was growing up and doing comedy in like high school. I was doing like like comedy on stage in high school. He was one of my mentors, and I remember I one of the most moving things that he'd ever done in my life was like um, he said to me one time. He's like he's like you don't know enough pop culture. Read a newspaper, pick up a comic, or <laughs> he like gave me some like like it was like a pop culture pep talk, pop culture and news pep talk. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember that. So, uh, yeah, okay. So we need to get to the comics. Uh, let's see. The first comic, um, I'm not sure if we should start with this. Honestly, this is my pick of the week. Uh, granted, we have an absolute carnage uh, Deadpool that we, we couldn't review because we did, we barely got enough copies for subscribers. Uh, absolute carnage is flying out the door. So if you find it, buy it. It's probably good, but we won't have it on our shelves. We're already sold out. Yeah, you need to sub if you want to get Absolute Carnage. you, you got to come in and talk to us. Um, so, uh, this comic is probably going to be my pick of the week, and I know it's weird to start with it, but, it, oh, God, it's so good for so many reasons. Uh, first of all, it opens with a fight between Damien and Gotham Girl, which, in my opinion, is, a, is an amazing matchup because Gotham Girl is so overpowered. Her character, it hints that, that her character and her brother before he died were as powerful as maybe more powerful than Superman. They might have been able to keep up with Superman. Um, so her versus Damien, if, if you know Damien at all, you know that he doesn't take anything lying down. And it, he doesn't care how outclassed he is. Like, he'll beat you. And I, I, I'm, I, I, can't, I can't spoil it, but you need to see that fight. It was cool. Um, and pretty much all of Gotham has been taken over by Bane. Bane has used Psycho Pirate to sway the minds of criminals. The criminals that aren't swayed yet, uh, they, they haven't been caught, so they're pretty much on the run. And the last time it was Kite Man and, uh, and uh, Scarecrow. And yeah. Ki Kite Man's story is so sad. I always feel so bad for Kite Man. And, and like, he takes Scarecrow up to his kite headquarters. What, what do you call it? Kite quarters? Yeah. yeah. Uh, kite, like, yeah, I think it was like kite quarters. And he's like, he's like, this is my kite quarters. And Scarecrow's like, is it safe? And he's like, well, I built it. So 
No. <laughs> it was so awesome. So anyways, Bane has taken over Gotham. Um, he's The reason he's doing it is because it's the one thing that, that Bruce Wayne was never able to control. So he's using the criminals to pretty much control Gotham and enforce the law. And meanwhile, like, the police are being tortured. I, I think Bullock's, like, a dartboard currently is what they showed. Um, and the rules are that all the soups have to stay out of there, as, as that's the deal that Bane hammered out with Lex. Um, all the soups have to stay out of there. They can't go anywhere near it. Uh, and if any of the Bat family go at it, uh, there will be consequences. So, of course, Damien has broken this rule. Now, um, you need to pick up this issue. Uh, we don't, I, I, honestly, we don't have enough, and I, I think we, we've already put in for more. But if you're remotely a Batman fan or a DC fan, this is crucial because... Uh, I, I, I can't say it without spoiling it, but something very tragic happens, and I have a feeling you're going to want this issue. So, yes. So come talk to us and special order this, and we, we've we already put in for a new order. Have we tried? I'm in. They're back ordered. They're back ordered. We don't have them, so you need to get this issue. We can't get it for you. I'm sorry. Uh, it w we'll have, like... I think 10 on the shelf, maybe. So we'll have 10 on the shelf. So if you get here tomorrow, pick this up. You you won't be disappointed. I mean, you might be a little sad, but... <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, it's a good check. <laughs> it was shocking. Uh, so issue number 77, City of Bane, Batman. Go pick this up. Um, next is Hellboy and the BPRD. And I, I didn't even know we were going to have this on the shelf. Did you? Yeah. It just magically showed up. And, it, you know, it was pretty good. It's typical BPRD stuff. Um, really, you know what you get if you get Hellboy. You get uh, really nice art that's, that's just gritty enough to tell the uh, BPRD stories. Um, on top of that, you get a storyline that's wicked, paranormal, a bit confusing, and you get tons of good one-liners from Hellboy. This is really no different. Um, I hate to say that it's kind of a formula, but it really is sort of the Hellboy formula, and it works. If you're a Hellboy fan, you know who you are. You'll love this. If, if you like Dark Horse books, come pick this up. It's pretty good. Um, granted, this is, I mean, it's a mystery. It involves, like, a bunch of corpses that have sort of had their, their ribs, their hearts ripped out, and their ribs sort of broken out, and they've stumbled upon a pretty much a mass grave of all these people, and they're trying to make sense of it. So that that's pretty much what it is. You know, Detective Paranormal, that's that's what it is. Hellboy, the BPRD, Saturn Returns. Pretty good read if you like this sort of thing. Uh, next is a shockingly good read, and that is the Deadpool Annual. Uh, there is a bunch of good jokes. I laughed out loud, I don't know how many times, like six or seven times. Uh, it's a great read, but we need to have a talk about that. The subject, the ending subject of this book is a little shocking and a little frightening. And Deadpool basically saves a kid from some bad stuff. Um, but we, we, we really should talk about that because um, there's a lot of parents that buy their kids Deadpool even after we warn them, hey, you probably shouldn't have your kid reading Deadpool. Um, this is one of those cases where I, I, will, I will loudly chime in if a parent tries to buy and be like, look, this content matter is not good for kids. And that's, that's the case with Deadpool Annual. Stop buying your kids Deadpool. I, I, I get it. I get it. He's a popular hero. Your kids see him. He, he looks appealing. He's funny. He's got a lot of funny crass jokes. But uh, really, this book in particular, the Deadpool Annual, Annual should only be for adults. That's all I'm going to say. So, uh, is it good? Yeah, it's darn good. The, the writing is great. The writing has improved. The, the art has improved. There is an artist on here named Guru FX. E-F-X. I've never heard of that artist. Have you? It's such a cool name. It stands out. So, anyways, uh, it's uh, Dana Schwartz, uh, Riley Brown, Nelson DeCastro, Matt Herms, and Guru FX. Go pick this up if you're an adult. It's great. It's honestly, I had a good time. There's a Neil Gaiman joke. Any book with a Neil Gaiman joke is awesome to me. Uh, <laughs> Next is Teen Titans, Year of the Villain, Dark Gifts. And uh, if you can't tell, Lobo is in play. Now, recently, they fought Lobo, and they beat Lobo. Like, Crush being Lobo's daughter, they, they wound up overcoming him uh, and pretty much, I think, killing him or at least stunning him enough so because you really can't kill, kill Lobo all that often. I, uh, anyways, so this opens with that, and it opens with, uh, well, Lex making his offer, which we sort of knew from the last issue when we saw the Lex bot go flying by. And, uh, yeah, so it, you, you, you know what you get from this sort of thing, but what, what else you get from this is that uh, Damien had a jail. Remember he had a jail, and he was jailing criminals, and uh, it was pretty inhumane. 
And so they've moved on to that and they started um, sort of rehabilitating them. But it also might be a kind of questionable way. So some of the villains are rehabilitated and that's good, but it looks really super questionable. So uh, Teen Titans, honestly, the, the, the subject matter and the topic brought about by Teen Titans these days is a really sort of deep topic. Like, like if you could make criminals harmless, like forcefully make them harmless, is that the right thing to do? I don't think so. But but they're really just going there, which is which is really nice to see. I mean, it's kind of a deep topic for Teen Titans, but it's not unheard of for them. So uh, Teen Titans number 33, it's a pretty good read. Go pick this one up. Uh, next is Nightwing, and oh god. I'm I'm tired of the the wings, as it were, the team of the wings. There's like one of them, maybe two of them I like, and I don't like the other two. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, uh, Grayson, once again, is not calling himself Dick. He's calling himself Rick. He, he doesn't really have a Nightwing outfit. He, he looks like, um, I, I don't know, it's like an outfit that Kiss would wear. And, uh, and then he smears, like, black dust across his eyes. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't like what they're doing. But if you can't tell, Talon's in play. And that, that Talon is, uh, oh, gosh, what is his name? I forget. It's... It's basically Rick Grayson's dad. I mean, not dad. Sorry. Great-granddad, William Cobb. Cobb. So great-grandpappy William Cobb. And if you know anything about William Cobb, William Cobb is known for um, saying that he likes to kill Waynes, which is pretty messed up. Uh, and so he's in play as Talon, and that's pretty much always a bad thing. Nightwing himself is haunted by the Court of Owls, and indeed uh, Batman is too. So having talent in play is not a good thing. It's especially not a good thing if uh, Nightwing's got memory issues and can't figure out who, who this guy is and how he should avoid him, and that shows. So is it a good story? It's a great story. I've, I've, I've actually had a lot of fun with the last couple of Nightwings. They've, the writing felt like it has improved. It doesn't feel like it's filler anymore. However, um, I'm kind of tired of that team. I, I don't know. The team is really, really choreographed in that the, the one guy who is really, really gun shy gets injured all the time. All the time. Meanwhile, the other one who is really, really gung ho, she she also gets injured all the time. And that's pretty much the storyline. One of them gets injured and the rest gotta like step it up. That's what they do. That's what they've done for how long has this been going on now? God. Like, like months. months. Months upon months. I'm tired of it. Yeah. Um so either rip the band-aid off and get rid of them or do something major with them. I don't know. But that's just my criticism of, of the writing. That, that doesn't mean I didn't like it. I had a perfectly good time. The art is great. Uh, the book was fun. Uh, you really can't say anything bad about this art. This art is amazing. And generally, the writer is, is pretty good. It's just lately it's felt like filler. But the last couple of issues have been good. So anyways, it's Jurgen uh, Cliquette. And Filardi, and this is uh, Nightwing number 63. Go pick it up if you're a DC fan. Next is Wonder Woman, come back to me. Now, I, I finally get what they're doing with this. They're, they're giving the trilogy all books. And they in, in doing so, they've given King Superman, and they've given Bendis uh, Batman, which is weird. And that's, that's Batman, what's it called? Batman space batman universe yeah, batman, batman universe and superman up in the sky and it, it turns out they've given connor uh uh paul miotti uh harden uh Dernick sinclair uh wonder woman come back to me now i didn't really like the first issue because uh like three of the storylines just felt like they, they were filler they were very clearly filler they weren't tied together they didn't really affect the story and the last one felt like they were doing something with steve trevor and uh it it works it it actually, I, I didn't have high hopes for this book. I honestly couldn't recommend the first book to, because it just didn't feel all that great. This was awesome. It was one, uh, one entire story. It wasn't broken up between three stories. Uh, they weren't weird. Uh, Wonder Woman meets up with Jonah Hex, and Jonah Hex and Wonder Woman was the buddy team I never knew I wanted but was hysterical. Because you know Jonah Hex is really blunt and, and does, he's, he's quick to shoot, and that's not really like Wonder Woman is quick to shoot but she'd like to know well, not shoot but she'd like to know who she's aiming at generally and uh, yeah she's responsible uh, but it was it was funny um, the writers just nailed it. it it honestly it felt 
It felt like a good Wonder Woman story. It felt like a good Jonah Hex story. So Wonder Woman, come back to me. Pretty good showing, honestly. Uh, better than the first. And I would say this is worth picking up if you're a DC fan. Okay, back, we're back. Our, our next book is Excellence. Now, we liked Excellence. We loved Excellence. I, I had a good time with the first issue. It centered around a family uh, that had ties to magic and pretty much... Uh, I, I think it was sort of coming of age and the main character was getting a wand and his brother had a wand. And for some reason it put them on like a collision course. But it's, it picks up where that left off. Um, we didn't get issue two and three. and I, I'm pretty sure we ordered it. It just never showed up and... We couldn't figure out why. But uh, Excellence issue number four, <clears throat> this takes place after the brothers have fought. Um, I love everything about the magic system. I love that the rules, like they can accidentally break the rules. And one of them was enforcing it and the other one got in trouble for it. Uh, it the art is just ridiculously cool. I, I love everything about this art. But the book itself, when the book plays out, like they give you these nice reminders about the rules. They give you, like, bulletins that sort of look like they'd be almost emails, but they're, like, magic emails, it feels like, with the font. It's really, really cool. The the <clears throat> the art is just, I can't get enough of it. It's it's honestly top-notch art. This is Brandon Thomas, uh, Kari Randolph, and Amelia Lopez. And this is by Image Skybound. It's just such a good showing. I want to know if there's this is actually equating to a language, because they... They put this stuff on the back. It's very House of X. And this yeah. did it first. This came out yeah. first. Um, so anyways, uh, having the best time with Excellence. Uh, granted, I missed a couple of issues. It should have been more confusing than it was. It wasn't. You just, all you need to know is that it's two brothers and one is, is mad at the other because the other one has broken some rules. That's it. Uh, so that's all you really need to know going into this. Excellence is awesome. This is a great showing. I hope this series continues past six. I really, really do. Um, again, uh, this is a rated M for mature book. Yeah, I can see why. There's, there's some, some touchy subjects. But anyways, Excellence uh, is an amazing comic. Go pick it up. Next is History of the Marvel Universe. I didn't know I was going to love that first book. Um, <clears throat> me and Al were talking about it, and we both agreed it was a lot of reading. It felt like we were reading a novel, a really, really super interesting novel about the Marvel Universe that is put together chronologically so like it's got the cowboy times it's got like you know everything that's the first issue it had fing fang foom who i i love fing fang foom just because of how you say his name <laughs> as a character nah, i mean it's a weird looking dragon but his name is amazing um and this was equally awesome this takes place i i want to say it's mostly the early superhero stuff. Like, they covered the cowboy comics. They covered uh, a lot of the detective stories in the, in the uh, last issue. Now they're covering um, pretty much all the superheroes and sort of the rise of the superheroes in the early stories. And they, they don't sugarcoat anything. They, they throw in groups that I, I have not heard of and don't remember because they were well before my time, probably well before your time too, Yogi. Yep. In fact, I'm older than you, so I'm sure that's the case. <laughs> um, but... You get the origin of characters that, that I didn't know had had a uh, an earthly origin. I guess you could say like Groot, of all things. Like yeah, that's kind of wild. Okay. Um, so anyways, it's it's a really 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 good read. It, it, more importantly, it's a fun read because if you love comics like I do, now now you've got uh, one more thing in your arsenal. You, you know a good chunk of the history. So really. History of the Marvel Universe, if you remotely like Marvel, if you slightly like Marvel, if Marvel is only kind of your thing, uh, come check this out. It's really, really great. It's, it's honestly awesome. I, I had a good time with this. I, I have no idea if a book like this will be worth money down the road, but it's written by Mark Wade, Javier Rodriguez, and Alvaro Lopez. Probably. It's Mark Wade. First of all, wasn't that done by uh, Alex Ross? Did Alex Ross do the cover? Yeah, I think he did do yeah. the cover for the first one. It's so awesome. It's yeah. honestly awesome. Uh, next is Transformers 84, or as I like to call it. Uh, hey, remember Transformers? <laughs> you remember? Uh, so this is Transformers from my generation. Uh, they're not hiding that this is the nostalgia factor. Granted, I have to tell you, I think the Transformers we have currently on the shelf is a really, really great comic. Really great comic. I mean, it's not Lost Light level, but it's getting up there. Um, however, this, this, I mean, it's Transformers 84. They're, they're going for the nostalgia factor. 
I wish they wouldn't dip so heavily on it. It's great. There's all the characters here. They, they did have... There's a reason for it. There's a secret. Somebody did something back then to spark the whole thing. Spark. And it's sort... No, it's not, that's not who it is. But there's, there's a couple characters that I haven't seen in a while. For instance, Counterpunch. Counterpunch, if you don't know, was the... Um, he was pretty much the spy. His name was Counterpunch for the Decepticons and Punch for uh, the Autobots. And he would change between. And he, his allegiance was sort of here and there. So a little bit all over the place. But what they're doing with this that makes me feel like they're going a little too hard on it is the art, even though it's the new art, is very clearly like newsprint. Like, like the, yeah, it looks bubbles. cool, right? But it just, it almost feels like you're trying a little too hard there for me. I, I don't know. But Hound's in it. There's Hound laughing. I'm cool with it. Uh, it's a good gloss print, too. It is a good gloss print. It's a really good print. The art is really, I mean, it's cool. It's cool to see. It's nice to see the OG Transformers. Bumblebee's in it, being Bumblebee. Uh, I, I recognize most of these characters. It's cool to see. But if do I think kids are going to buy this? Nah, not really. I think they'll probably buy the mainline Transformers off the shelf. Will adults buy this? Maybe. I, I thought it was cool. I, I don't think it's something you should skip. It's issue zero. It's kind of cool to see um, uh, sort of a changing of the mythos. Um, I just think that if you weren't super into Transformers back in the day, back in the OG cartoon days, this probably won't be your thing. That's all I'm going to say. So, yep. Pretty good showing. Next is Hugo Award winning Sean, uh, Shannon McGuire. I'm going to say her name right because it's spelled S E A N A N. Shannon, but isn't it? It's, I think it's Shannon McGuire. I, I can't. I, I might be butchering her name. Anyways, Hugo Award winning Shannon McGuire. Ghost Spider. Uh, this is also with uh, Miyazawa and Herring. And this is. Uh, Spider Gwen has basically accepted the moniker of Ghost Spider finally. She's also decided that she can't keep doing what she's doing in her world because everyone there knows that she's Gwen Stacy. She can't seem to find a job because of it. Uh, you know, she puts her friends and family in danger pretty much. So. She's sort of got to move on. So she's trying to balance her social life in her regular world and then go to school in 616. This isn't a good idea. Everybody knows this isn't. The characters know this isn't a good idea. The readers, we, we know this isn't a good idea. This is a terrible idea. However, it's still cool to see. Um, now, do you remember her suit? Her suit, she lost her powers. And her, yeah, her suit is a symbiote suit made out of spiders, like a bunch of jelly spiders that can, like, sort of change their form and, and change her clothing and everything at will. And she's been having trouble with them. They've been running off and stuff like that. Well, they get to the bottom of this, and gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it, the problem is she needs to eat more food. Yeah, heavy in like fiber and stuff like that. So she's got to eat like wheat or something. I think it's like cellulose or something. So she's got to eat like wheat and like kale chips or something else. And uh, yeah, I, I thought that was a weird solution, but kind of cool. I mean, it explains it, I, I guess. <laughs> but I, I didn't hate it. Um, everything about this was really good for an issue one. Um, it's got, you know, Ghost Spider and Peter Parker hanging out. Um, they're doing their thing. It's, it's funny. They're having a good time. You can tell that they're friends, which I love between these two characters. More importantly, she goes to apply to college to, get a, to, to go to school, and she winds up qualifying for Tony Stark's scholarship. Can you guess why? Because she comes from another Universe? dimension. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he has a scholarship in place for anyone that is off-world, anyone that is other dimension, anyone that comes from another plane or realm that wants to go to school there. And I thought, what a, nice. th what a nice Tony yeah. thing to do. Good yeah. guy, Tony, man. That's a good scholarship. <laughs> so she's like, what? I get a scholarship? This is, this is amazing. She's going to wind up being permanent 616, you know it. Yeah. Um, but anyways... So, uh, issue one, Ghost Spider, go pick this up. If you're a Spider-Man fan, go pick this up. I think they're doing something great here. The art is amazing. Uh, well, so I'm sort of on the fence. The art is amazing most of the time. Every once in a while, I, I'm not sure. Every once in a while, I, I, it's kind of iffy for me. Most of it is really, really great. Um, but I, I have high hopes for it. It's an issue one. Um, if you like any of the Spider-Man stuff, if you like any of the Marvel stuff, if you're DC and you want to dip your toes in a number one for Marvel and just, you know, see what it's like on the other side of the fence, this is a great book to do it with. Uh, next is The Goon and...
There's a lot of funny here, I gotta tell you. So, the goon is dealing with uh, the god of hobos. Uh, yeah, the god of hobos. It opens with a scene that is very much godfather. So, you come to me, you come to the goon on the day of so-and-so's wedding when we could be down there eating free cake. And you ask for his help? Uh, it's, I, pff, I love everything Eric Powell. I don't think I've hit it by now. But um, the goon is pretty much a fun uh, knock around story, and this one centers around beaten hobos. And I love, I can't ever remember his, uh, his buddy, the little guy, but the little guy is funnier than Goon most of the time. Like, he pops up and he's like, Oh, we're, we're, we're dealing with hobos. Let me get my, uh, my lead pipe hobo beater. And like, goes off to beat up hobos. <laughs> Basically, um, the hobos are eating the rich. That's all you need to know. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty good show. I mean, I like everything good, and I, I like everything Eric Powell. And this isn't just Eric Powell. This is Eric Powell and um, Rachel Cohen. Eric Powell, Rachel Cohen, edited by Tracy Marsh. They give an editor credit. How nice. That is nice. That is nice. And El Jefe, the boss, is Andrea Smith. Good job, Albatross. Um, I love everything good coming out of you guys. Um, granted, I, I love Hillbilly, too. So everything Eric Powell. I got to check out the um, cover artist. I'm pretty sure the cover artist is Rachel Cohen. No, no it's Powell. Oh, it is. It's Powell. Yeah. Yeah, Eric Powell. Yep. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Special edition cover is Scotty Young, and I don't think we have it. That's oh, wild. Bummer. Go figure. Oh, um, it is it good? Yeah, it's good. Oh. Uh, you can still order them. I'll flash a picture. Mm. We'll order them. Um, okay, next book. <clears throat> we have a lot of them. I'm not sure why we went so deep on them. I'm kind of shocked by it. But um, it does involve something that's sort of important. We're dealing with the death of Rocket Raccoon and the explanation as to why he is sick and dying. And uh, he does a very Rocket thing, I've, I've got to tell you. So we're also dealing with the uh, Universal Church of Truth which whenever you deal with them, it's pretty much a bad day. And currently, uh, they change from, the, from their death views to their life views. And, and this is pretty much what the Universal Church of Truth does. They, they brainwash people, and um, they, they just you know, try to make them see their way and then you know, work them, use them to their purpose. So they've lost a couple members. They're relying on Rocket. Uh, Rocket is sick. But uh, you know the people they've got with them, they've got Beta Ray Bill and uh, um, um, Lockjaw. Which is amazing. Beta Ray Bill and Lockjaw, I think they revealed in like the last couple issues that they've got they've got like a lot of history of going around and hanging out and like tackling things in the universe. And I don't think it's ever been covered. So I, I really honestly wanna see that happen. Like I wanna see that book get covered. Uh, okay. that was a good thing to hint to. So anyways, um so they're they're sort of dealing with that. You know, Groot's got the Mohawk and everything. There's there's really Nothing to complain about this this uh, Guardians of the Galaxy run. Uh, I get it though. If if all the only Guardians of the Galaxy you know is just from the movies, you probably don't realize that they cycle members every once in a while. So this might be a shock to you. But this team is awesome. There's a lot of synergy here. More importantly, there's Beta Ray Bill and Lockjaw. Which when the, when those those characters are in anything, I'm I'm pretty much paying attention. So uh, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy issue number eight. Go pick this up if you're a Marvel fan. Or if you're a sci-fi fan, because it's perfectly good sci-fi. Another book we got a lot of, and we're not quite sure why. Uh, and that's Daredevil number 10. Now, is it good? Well, let's check in with old Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock had uh, given up the mantle of uh, Daredevil. He was he basically got put into a, a situation where he got framed, and then he was fighting with cops, and then the Punisher showed up, and he was like, hey, man, so we're the same now. <laughs> and, and Daredevil's like, no, I don't. No, we're really not. So he gave up the mantle, and um, it's been haunting him. It's been haunting him, I think, because uh, supposedly there's another Daredevil in play that he's hearing, I think. And he's also hearing the city all the time, and he you know, wants to respond. And so that's what's going on. He's been dealing with corrupt cops, pretty much, and trying to get to the bottom of all that, and trying to decide if he should just give up the mantle. And, you know, I mean, he does it. Obviously, the book is called Daredevil. He's going to take it back. But, uh, yeah, is this issue worth reading? Totally worth reading. More importantly, there's an old Daredevil favorite character that makes a reappearance at the end of the issue. So you really need to go check this out. Issue number 10 of Daredevil is a, is a darn good read. More importantly, the art. This is Zdarsky, uh, Fornes, and Bel Air, and the art is really cool. It's, it's like that perfect amount of grit 
the perfect amount of grit, not too much. And that's why I like it. It feels like the, the Punisher stuff that's on the shelf right now is what it feels like. It's like the hill of Coach is like, you don't need to do the Daredevil anymore. Just be Steve Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, in the current Captain America run, they approached him and they said, like, you don't need to be Captain America anymore. The world needs Steve Rogers. So Yogi just made that joke that, that, that the world doesn't need Daredevil. They need Steve Rogers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good joke. Uh, oh, I forgot to give Cardians credit. Um, that's Dottie Cates, uh, Corey Smith, and David Curiel. Excellent job, Cates. guys. Yeah, good Cates. Morning. Go figure. We're, we're talking about like it being a good story, and it's Cates. So, uh, next is an amazing story. Honestly, this was almost my pick of the week. And granted, I think my Batman bias probably took over, and maybe this should be my pick of the week. But Jane Foster's Valkyrie is so awesome. This is uh, Aaron, go figure, Jason Aaron. Uh, Aaron and Ewing. Yeah. Awesome. Aaron Ewing, uh, Keifu, and Abertov. And this is just an amazing read. We have a, a, a new hero with a new power set. And I don't recall the previous Valkyrie, Brunhilde, ever, like her powers ever sort of being revealed. And I could be mistaken. But this stuff is new to me. More importantly, Jane Foster's got the weapon called the... Uh, Unterjager, Unterjager. I think it's it. It means the all weapon. So she basically has a golden bracelet that can transform into weapons, and and that comes into play. It transforms into all types of stuff. But the one she favors is like a warhammer that looks like a bat, which is a beast of a weapon. I never knew I needed to have in my life. Um, so that's awesome. And then she's learning her power set, and one of her powers is that she can see when people are going to expire. She sees. Pretty much, if their death is coming up, she, there's like this purple, like, like it's almost like a frowning, like an evil face that's above. And it gets bigger as their death gets closer. So she's learning that she can use that to spot when something's coming for a person. And that is really, really cool to see. So new power set, new hero, or well, okay, new telling on an old hero, uh, new weapon. Everything about this is amazing. The last issue ended with Bullseye having uh, Brunhilde's weapon, um, the, the Sword of the Valkyrie, which gives him control of the horse, too. Uh, and that's, that's terrible for Bullseye to have. Like, he's already got... He already has, like, really, really uh, good dexterity where he can turn anything into a deadly weapon and, and throw it and have it hit its mark. So giving him a sword like that that can return on command is a bad thing. So, <laughs> yeah... Uh, it's pretty awesome to see. So issue number two, Jane Foster's Valkyrie. Go pick this up. More importantly, I, I think Jane Foster is the... They're doing the Mighty Thor in yeah, the movie, aren't they? The Mighty Thor. The Mighty Thor. So anyways, you, you want to get on board with this. It's just a really, really good comic. I had a great time with it. So if you're a Marvel fan, Jane Foster Valkyrie. If you're a DC fan, you want to dip your toes in some Marvel. Again, Jane Foster Valkyrie is a good pick. Uh, next is Powers of X. Now... We need to talk about this. House of X had a really, really strong opening, I thought. I thought it was, it, it was one of the best books I've read all year. Hickman really knocked it out of the park. Uh, this is Hickman, Silver, and uh, Gracia. Now, Powers of X had a little confusing of a story. It was like a timeline spread out over, like I think, four generations. And it was a little weird. And basically, it was involving the lives of uh, Mo Moira. Moira. I can never pronounce that name. Um, the mutant... Moira, who lives all these same lives uh, on different timelines, I guess. And eventually she gets killed and then she's reborn on another timeline with her same mentality. And that's pretty much what's, what it's been tackling. This one wraps up the ninth timeline for her, which is the one that involves Nimrod. And there's a reason for it. Now so anyways, uh, we had technical issues, but we're back. Um, so that was the ninth timeline. And so she pretty much retains all her memories of her different life as she goes into the next. And this is the 10th timeline. And she was told, I think, in the last one that <clears throat> the 10th was, like, her final timeline. That, that, like, that's all she was going to get. So it's really, really interesting to see. Um, the art is amazing. Honestly, as far as Powers of X is concerned, like, I had a really great time with House of X. I thought House of X number one was great. I thought Powers of X number two and number three were a little confusing, but still kind of interesting because they centered around all the different timelines. This one was awesome. I had a great time with this from start to finish. Uh, more importantly, I, I got to know what was going on, why the characters were doing what they were doing. 
Uh, it's pretty much Apocalypse versus Nimrod, which uh, it is a nice fight I didn't know I wanted. So um, anyways, uh, Powers of X, the art is amazing, the story is amazing. Uh, this one was almost as good as House of X number one, so if you like, if, if you like the mutant flavor in your comics... If, uh, if you're a Marvel fan, go pick this up. If you're a DC fan and you want to dip your toes in something good that's mutant and Marvel, uh, Powers of X, you really can't go wrong with this issue. Um, last book on our list is Black Mask, and this is by Taylor Hamner Stewart. Did I give them credit on the last one? I did, right? Hickman, Silver, and Gracia. Okay, so Taylor Hamner and Stewart is on Black Mask. So if you don't know, pretty much a lot of the, the main villains in the DC Universe are getting one-shots. At least I think they're one-shots. Uh, the last one was Sinestro. This one centers around Black Mask. And you know, the art I'm a little iffy on. I'm not sure what to make. It's, it's almost too gritty at times. But it still works for me. It, it's actually a, it was a pretty good read. Um, the storyline is great, and it centers around pretty much any of these villains are just doing what they normally do, and they get the offer from Lex. The, the Lex bot shows up, Lex drone. Is it a Lex bot, Lex drone? We don't know. I think they call it a Lex bot. But it flies in, it pulls out a holographic version of Lex. They usually make fun of the way Lex looks because he looks different. He's Apex Lex, uh, which is just fun to say. Um, but yeah, and then he gives them the offer, and it's usually a weapon or some change to their power set that can improve it. So he gives that to Black Mask, and, and I didn't know I wanted this, but Black Mask is actually pretty scary now. Like, used to be he was sort of a throwaway villain, kind of, like, I don't know, it, it just, to me, felt like generic Red Skull, and he might have came first, I don't know. But usually they, they... They put him up against, like, newer heroes. I remember Red Hood had, like, a long-running issue with Black Mask for a while there. And he's, he's a perfectly serviceable villain. He just... And Lex calls him on it, too. He's like, man, you don't think big enough. Like, well, the way you think is, is really limited. So he gives him a power set, a, a new power, rather. And uh, that makes him frightening. Like, legitimately scary. Something that I wouldn't want Black Mask to have, and it centers around his mask... Uh, that's what he gets. And it was super interesting to see. Now, granted, I'm going to be a little hard on this book and say that the art was not as appealing to me as, as, as I wanted it to be. I was sort of on the fence about the art. But <clears throat> as far as uh, the story is concerned, um, and, and the art, you remember I'm an art snob, so really you got to take me being picky about it just, just with a grain of salt. The, uh, the story was great. It was really cool. I, I didn't know I wanted this extra story. I didn't know I wanted this depth to Black Mask because they talk a, a little bit about his, his origin, and it's kind of a sad origin. So, yeah, Black Mask Gear, the villain, uh, number one, I think it's a one-shot, but the evolution of evil, pretty good showing. I, I had a good time with this. So go pick it up if you're a DC fan. If, if you're a Marvel fan and you want to dip your toes in some DC, I, I don't think this is the book for you. I think go pick up a different book, like pick up a hero book. But uh, anyway, so You're the Villain, Black Mask, pretty good showing, though. Um, all this Year of the Villain stuff is, is pretty good. I tend to like it. And we've got this Dark Crystal Age of Resistance on the back. So have we confirmed? Is this all CGI? I don't know, but I think Jim Henson's super laser It looks really, really cool. So I'm kind of on the fence about it. Um, but that's our show for this week. Oh, we, we forgot to do the drawing, so it magically appeared. Hooray! So let them know. Oh, yeah. We're drawing for... They're just ash cans. We, we ran out of posters, I think. So do we, we have posters? A poster left. We have a poster left. So, so you first might come, get first serve. a poster. First come, first serve. Which one is that? Marvel Monsters. Marvel Monsters. That's cool. Uh, if not, we have ash cans. Um, ash cans are pretty much sampler books. And normally we just put them out, but we figured it's fun. It's like, it's like a free comic. You get four free samples of, of comics. And this is for burger books. And that is Ruby Falls, The Seeds, and Everything, which I've never heard of. And then Invisible Kingdom, which was an awesome read. Uh, so, yeah, Burger Books, they, these are the ash cans we're giving away. And really, they're free. We just ran out of stuff to give away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so let's see here. 132. Arlene Flanagan. Arlene Fl Flanagan. Yeah, Arlene Flanagan. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, 150. Eric Serrano. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, Eric stopped picking up his books, so we, we can't have him win. Uh, sorry. Uh, 145. 
Jonathan Gonzalez. Jonathan Gonzalez, you won something. And last in drawing for this week is 236. Uh, Monica Serta. Monica Serta. So all of you have won uh, either a sampler or a poster. Uh, first come, first serve on the poster. And that's our show for the week. So that's it. Do the dance. Mm -hmm.